can see it. Awesome. Okay, cool. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to Trust But Verify, Maintaining Democracy in Spite of Information Countermeasures. My name is Ali Mellon. I'm a security strategist in the office of the CSO at Cyber Reason. I've uh, been with Cyber Reason for almost two years now, and I've been in the tech space for about a decade. Um, and over that time, especially over the past two to three years, I've been working with the FBI, local law enforcement, DHS, um, and other governments such as the UK in order to help secure our elections. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. But before we really get into that, we're going to talk about what's truly critical to our daily lives. And I think it's very important to start with this because though we don't always consider it, it's actually something that is really necessary before we feel comfortable voting. So when we think about what's truly critical to our daily lives, I usually think about this in the context of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We're thinking about each layer of this pyramid and the things that we really need to to reach that level of um, self-actualization. So that's starting with physiological needs like air, water, food, shelter, that type of thing, before moving up to things like personal safety. Um, I also like to loop in employment and a ability to get resources into this level. Then we jump into belonging. This one is actually really critical, especially when it comes to elections. And this is things like friendship, intimacy, and family, that sense of connection that you have to others. Then we reach esteem, things like respect and self-esteem, status, recognition. Before reaching the top of that pyramid, which is self-actualization and really becoming the best one can be. So what I want you guys to be thinking about as we go through this is where does voting fit into this process? And that's really what this talk is all about. So we'll start with the defender perspective before diving into the daily life of a voter. Then we'll go to the red team side of things and talk about the attacker perspective before really starting to brainstorm what could you do to stop an election and how can we use that information to actually protect our elections. So throughout this talk and as um, we really get into some of these examples, both historical and present day, I want you to be thinking about how you could take that and actually attack an election and then use that to defend one. So let's start with the defender perspective and we're really gonna start by thinking about the state of play today. Right now, we have a very narrow definition of election infrastructure. This is according to the DHS. Um, it's very specific to the actual equipment surrounding counting the votes and um, the infrastructure involved in that, things like the voter rolls, the databases and associated IT systems, that sort of thing. But what these exercises with um, the government have taught me is, is that really all we need to be worried about when it comes to having a free and fair election and protecting that election? And what I've realized is that it really isn't. And in fact, what we really need is to understand more comprehensively the things that people need in order to feel comfortable and safe going to vote. I call this the voter hierarchy of needs, and it maps really well to Maslow's hierarchy of needs as we consider what people need to get to the top of that pyramid. So it starts again with the physiological needs. We have things like life and death and up higher on the pyramid, things like property. If you don't feel like you have um, your life protected, or if you're in constant fear of being murdered or being hurt, then most likely voting is not your first priority. You're going to be thinking about how you can get to the point where you feel safe. And related is that safety element, but this comes across in many different ways through things like personal and family health and safety at work. If you are out of a job, you have a lot of different priorities and voting might ne not necessarily be one of them. 
Next, belonging. And this one is actually so critical. And I think that in a way, um, simultaneously people really think about it and lose focus and lose track of it. But belonging is so critical because if you don't feel like you belong to a society, you're not gonna wanna contribute to it. And the way that you contribute to it is through the power of your vote. And then of course, esteem is really important. This is things like thinking your vote actually matters, thinking that you matter in the society, having that self-esteem and self-respect and respect from others, that your opinion in the society matters. And all of that is of course leading to self-actualization. In this case, it's really not just about being the most that you can be, it's about making sure that your country is the most that it can be. So this is how I like to think about the things that voters need in order to feel safe, comfortable, and willing to actually go out and vote. And it's the type of thing that makes me question if really that limited definition of election infrastructure is comprehensive. Because these systems that we see, that we really need to protect, they actually are the exact systems that can be a target for attackers who want to disrupt an election, whether they want a particular side to win or not. And it's especially true when we see that even in a developed country like the United States, 40% of people don't vote. That's a huge portion of the population. And so any type of voter suppression can have a real impact on an election. When we're thinking about election integrity and election security, it's so critical to think about other elements that relate to things like voter suppression and that faith in government. There are other ways to influence an election and even things like voter suppression really can be an attack on democracy. So let's dive into the attacker perspective. And since you, I think that most of your audience um, is in the cyber realm, I don't have to tell you that this isn't evil. Um, this is why we red team. It's really important to understand the attacker perspective in order to make the system better. And everything that we talk about here is just trying to identify gaps so that we can close them. When we're thinking about the actual motivation that an attacker has, especially when it comes to a nation state, we're thinking about things like gaining power, spreading a particular ideology, or maintaining that global recognition and support. And this can be countries like Russia, this could be China, this could be the United States. There are a lot of different countries that have motivations that are on a global scale and they need to um, use things or they seem to think that they need to use things like suppressing votes or affecting elections in order to get and meet their objectives. So the way that I like to think about this is in three separate layers that attackers can target. And I, I view this for all cyber attacks. This is not just limited to, um, not limited to elections, but it's an important way to think about how these different attacks are actually having an impact. And that's in the form of the infrastructure plane, the information plane, and an ethos plane. So what we're gonna do is we're going to um, look at some both historical examples and some present day examples for each of these planes. And it's really important to note that some of these will not necessarily be directly related to cyber, especially when it comes to the historical examples. But all of that said, what's really interesting, and you'll see this throughout the presentation, a lot of these examples, while they don't have a cyber element, they could very easily be up-leveled and elevated with a cyber component. So we'll start with the ethos plane, and this is all about targeting and attacking that belief system in a country and the belief system of the voters in that country. And what I like to start with is the Italian elections of 1948. So this was a time where the US government was really intent on psychological warfare. 
they were pushing um, millions of dollars was going into Christian Democratic and right-wing socialist parties. And there were two very massive propaganda campaigns, um, both against the communist socialist coalition and for it. And the goal was to change this election and change the perception of this election to democracy versus totalitarianism and Christianity versus atheism. It was really about this America versus the Soviet Union. And what was fascinating about this is that it worked so well that the United States actually repeated this process in countries like Guatemala, South Vietnam, Afghanistan, Indonesia, and many, many more. Now, again, this does not have a cyber component, it was a while ago, <laughs> but through these um, propaganda campaigns, you can really easily see how using the internet to um, spread these campaigns more readily could have an even broader impact, an even greater one. And we are starting to see that with Russian election interference in the United States, for example. Another example is um, actually coming from Moscow directed at the United States where they began to urge the American Communist Party to pursue revolutionary regime change in the US. And it was very much so a historical analog to the democracy promotion that Washington later pursued. Another interesting example that really targets multiple planes is the 1996 Chinese influence in the US election. In 1996, $300,000 was sent from a Chinese general to um, the Clinton campaign in an attempt to influence the US presidential election. Now, this was later revealed, but it was a really pivotal moment because it really introduced this concept of, well, perhaps our elections are being targeted by foreign interference. And perhaps it's even to the point where they're directly sending money to candidates that they want to support and that they want to win. Now, let's look at some examples from the 2016 US presidential election that target that belief system, specifically with social media. On the right, you can see an example of a social media attack where someone from Stop AI is promoting a Facebook post that um, tries to sow a divisive message and tries to make it seem like this is a point of conflict for people in the United States who are American citizens. It's not actually from an American citizen, but the point is to really try to um, create friction in the country between two groups. On the left, you can see an example from Twitter that's um, a bit odd, but it actually tries to convince people that they can vote from home through text message. And what's fascinating about this is this is the type of thing that could be very impactful in this election, especially for people who do not want to go outside and wait in polling lines and wear their mask and risk getting coronavirus. They'd much rather stay home and just text the government their vote. But of course, this isn't possible and it's just meant to make sure that those votes don't count. And we have a lot of companies talking about election security and election integrity and really not doing enough to protect it. And I think this is worth mentioning and this quote is worth having here because what I've seen more and more and what you guys will see throughout this talk is that election security is about way more than the government's response. Inevitably, due to the way that we communicate and share information, companies like social media companies have an obligation to help protect our election integrity and the government cannot, simply cannot do it without them. So when we have people shifting the blame in cases like these, we're actually not coming up with a solution that is for the betterment of society and I think that it's an important issue that we should bring to the forefront as much as possible. This is not just a government issue. Now, 
Next, we're going to look at some information plane attacks. This is confusing people with things like propaganda, trying to get them to believe something that isn't necessarily true, um, trying to, in some ways you could say, alter their reality. And the first way that I want to talk about this is a very interesting example, which is the foundations of America. Because for a lot of people, we think that this idea of misinformation and disinformation is relatively new because of the internet, but the reality is very different. America was founded on the premise of a conspiracy theory where the British were trying to enslave us. Sam Adams actually argued that Britain's taxations were part of an elaborate conspiracy to eventually enslave American colonists. He spread this disinformation and other early disinformation through pamphlets and speeches with information that he knew was untrue. And he leveraged the Boston Massacre to further propel his efforts. Now, was he doing it for the right reasons? It's really um, <laughs> tough to say, but the reality was that he was sharing propaganda that he knew was not true in order to change the outcome of what came to be and what is to this day one of the largest superpowers in the world. So that's the basis for a country that is now really struggling with disinformation. Go figure. The next one I want to talk about is the CIA and the propaganda asset inventory. We're talking about the 50s, the 60s, just the Cold War era. And a lot of people know about how much propaganda the CIA actually put out during this time. But there are a couple of interesting stories that I want to pull from that I find just fascinating. The first one is um, the CIA control of Radio Free Asia. So they were trying to spread particular messages to people in Asia, but they realized that the average person in Taiwan most likely did not have a radio. So they actually strapped radios to balloons and tried to send them over to Taiwan. Needless to say, the wind went the other direction and carried them off, so they weren't actually able to um, to get the radios there, but it's still a very interesting story and attempt to um, spread more propaganda. The second example is a magazine called Forum World Features, and the CIA would place a lot of false stories in that magazine, but it actually became so popular that it ended up being distributed to the United States as well. And so they had to be very careful of where they placed the fake stories and make sure it wasn't getting into the US edition. So interesting times, um, definitely. And of course, hardly a left-wing newspaper wasn't fa financed directly from Moscow at that time in Europe. Another great example is the U.S. radio in Moscow. So from 1976 to 1982, it was very difficult to get uh, rock music into Moscow, things like Elton John and the Beatles. Um, so the U.S. actually had a radio station that made it to Moscow with that music. And the music was usually followed by quote unquote editorial content, which Soviet authorities considered disinformation. Now, here's a closer to home example that actually does incorporate that cyber element. And I think that this really speaks to the shift that we're seeing from historical examples like I just talked about to ones that actually incorporate that cyber element, but still taking the same ideas, just using them in the new way on a new medium. So, in Ukraine in 2014, on the 21st of May, attackers compromised the CEC network and were able to um, disable vote counting. Now, while this was only for a short time, like 12 hours, it still has an impact on the people in the country and their faith in the government, especially as it was being reported on. However, to make things worse, four days later on the 25th, which was actually election day, there was a constant denial of service attack on the CEC website. 
and 12 minutes before the polls closed, attackers posted a picture of the former leader of the right sector on the CEC website in an attempt to claim that he won the election. And just like that, it was widely shared by Russian media. So this, of course, one, makes people lose faith in their government because the government clearly has no control over what's being posted on websites that they're responsible for. And the second is it really does sow confusion about who won, whether or not people should continue to go vote, whether their vote matters anymore. There are lots of questions that this raises and a lot of concerns that it raises after the fact as to whether the results are actually accurate. So let's dive into communication examples. These are very interesting. Um, we're gonna start with, again, two examples from the presidential election in 2016. The first of which you can see on the right is a message that's supposedly from the government giving this individual the location of their polling place and the hours that it's open. Needless to say, that's not a legitimate um, address for a polling location and you can't actually submit your ballot there. So that's a very easy way to get someone to go to the wrong address, try to vote, and one, get very frustrated that they can't, and two, potentially run out of time if they have to get to work. They'll most likely be annoyed at the government, think that that was a government mistake, and then potentially not even vote because they've already wasted 20 minutes or however long it takes them to get there. On the left, you can see an attempt by someone who claims to be President Trump. It's, <laughs> spoiler alert, it is not. Um, but claiming that this person's ballot has yet to be submitted and trying to shame them into submitting it. And of course, that is really just meant to push certain voters to vote for President Trump and could, potentially really turn off a lot of voters who are wondering why their vote is being tracked and um, by the government and tr President Trump, and also like why they're being pushed to do something that perhaps they don't want to do. That could turn off a lot of people very quickly. Let's dive now into the infrastructure plane. I find this one the most fascinating because it's very, um, I think that for a lot of people, it's very challenging to connect the reality of cyber attacks to an actual physical event, an actual physical damage. And so we're gonna start again with those historical examples and then get into potential real world examples. The first one I wanna talk about is the assassination of Lumumba. Um, he was the prime minister of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and he was actually assassinated in 1961. He was elected in 1960, and that was when the DRC actually gained independence and he was voted in. Um, so first, super, super politically fracturing for a very, very new independent nation to lose their prime minister to assassination a year after he's been elected. That's very painful. Um, and I can imagine would cause people to feel dismayed about um, whoever is the next PM and confused and having to jump into a situation that they just shouldn't happen in a country that's so young. But the added context is that that assassination was actually carried out by the US government and the government of Belgium. So you have this very small, very new country being attacked by two large countries who are substantially um, more entrenched in global politics and much more supported by other countries. And that is just something that would be totally demoralizing to a new country electing someone new and then having that person killed by to enormous powers in the world. The next is the Indonesian elections and subsequent massacre in 1965. So for a little context, 
there was an election, the Communist Party finished fourth, and they were offered proportional representation in the government. And the US secretly supported the purge of suspected communists when they found this out because they did not want, um, they didn't think it was in their interests to have the Communist Party in power there. And thousands to millions died over months because of it. And the military actually took over as the most powerful institution. So this type of attack obviously kills, but it also terrifies the public. Who is going to go out and talk freely about their point of view and their views after they see all of these people massacred for doing that? It's just highly unlikely at best. And further, who is going to go vote for someone that they support if they're afraid that that person will cause them to be murdered later because they are suddenly tagged as a communist or tagged as whatever um, some other world power doesn't like? So this is the type of thing that could really destroy people's wish to go vote and really ties into that safety level of the voters hierarchy of needs both personal and family now the bronze knight is a much more recent example that does incorporate that cyber component it doesn't fall specifically on election day but it's a great example of how you can really combine the infrastructure attacks and the information attacks um, in order to cause a lot of chaos so the Bronze Knight was a night when Estonia decided to move a statue of a Red Army soldier to a Soviet cemetery instead of having it in like the center, um, of course, which makes total sense given, given their history. But when they started to do this, fake news began to spread with Russian news reports claiming that both the statue and Soviet war graves were actually being destroyed. This resulted in two nights of riots and looting, and 156 people were injured, one person was left dead, and 1,000 people were detained. What's important to note is that while all of this disinformation was being spread, there were also ongoing infrastructure attacks, denial of service attacks targeting banks, media outlets, and the government. This was preventing people from getting cash from ATMs. This was preventing people from doing any online banking. Government employees couldn't communicate over email and newspapers and broadcasters couldn't deliver the news. So needless to say, the Estonian news was down but the Russian news, which was spreading misinformation and disinformation, was up and at them. So this is a great example of combining that cyber element with a denial of service attack with kind of that cyber element, but very much so just that propaganda element of spreading disinformation through different news channels and actually resulting in death. And this quote really captures that for me, is what I think is really important to highlight here is especially with cyber, we see how difficult attribution is, but we see how much chaos it can cause. So when we're thinking about all of these previous examples from Lumumba to um, the massacre of the communists, imagine if these communications had been done through a cyber method where you can speak to someone and pretend that you're a part of that country even when you aren't. And unless that person is particularly tech savvy, then you'll most likely get away with it. And there are a lot of cases where you can get away with it. So ultimately you can really make it seem like it's just a um, local conflict as opposed to something that's being internationally backed and pushed. Now, here's some examples that um, I think are particularly uh, potentially troublesome and that we saw during some of these election security exercises. And we can start with the electric grid. So in 2003, a four day power outage left 100 people in the United States and Canada dead. These, this number is, of course, baffling and horrifying. Uh, and it's a great example of an instance where if a certain part of town loses power on election day, you're gonna be much more worried about how you get power back 
what groceries in your fridge are going bad. If you have someone in your family who's in a hospital, you're gonna be much more worried about going and making sure that they are okay and that they have what they need than you are going to care about voting. So when you have an attack on the electric grid on election day, and what's fascinating about this is you can take that and make it even worse by only targeting specific districts that you know fall for a particular political party. Even if you don't really care which side wins, that will sow chaos for more than just that day, but for years to come as, as conspiracy theories begin to crop up about how the other side intentionally took down the electric grid. There's so much possibility here that we really need to be careful of. And I also wanna think about things like transit because this is so critical to people getting to their polling place. We see that time and time again, especially when people's location to go vote is so far away from where they live in more rural areas. But even with things like in 2016, when San Francisco's transit system was infected with ransomware, imagine you decide to go vote after work, which a lot of people do you live in a major city, you take the train into work, you work throughout the day, we'll say this is a normal non-pandemic day. Um, you go to work, spend the day working, you probably are on Twitter, you scroll past some disinformation, maybe you even share it if you don't realize what it is, and then you go out for your lunch break, you come back, you work the rest of the day, you go to take the train to your polling place and back home, but the train has been attacked with ransomware, and now you have no way to get home. And you have to figure out, oh, am I gonna shell out the extra cash for an Uber? What am I gonna do in this situation? I'm gonna have my friend come pick me up. But really what you're focused on now is getting home. It's not on going to vote. And these are the things that we really need to be careful of is all of these different roadblocks that attackers can feasibly put up. And we see that these attacks can go across all of these layers, both the infrastructure information and ethos, but also all the layers of the pyramid as well. And even if we start to dig out one layer of the pyramid, you're going to really affect at least some portion of the population's ability to go vote. Not even talking about if you attack multiple layers at once. So, Let's dive back into the defender perspective and talk about where this really leaves us. Right now, as we've discussed, we have this really limited and narrow definition of election infrastructure. It comes with things like voter registration, databases, IT infrastructure, all the voting systems, that type of thing. And where do we end up? We end up with comments like this. We cannot exclude such activities in Germany will have to confront distortions and fake stories, which on the one hand, don't get me wrong, it's great that they're talking about it, but this type of comment just starts the conversation. It doesn't give citizens a way that they can actually protect themselves. What does it mean confront distortions and fake stories? Where does that leave citizens when they're thinking about this other than having even less faith in their government because now they don't know what they can trust and they're being told by the government that they don't know what they can trust. We're also seeing it with high profile um, presidents talking about how elections are scams. We're seeing it even on the opposite side of the coin with top congressional Democrats also talking about this. And again, talking about how it's kind of an inevitability, but not talking about solutions. And this is why I think it's so critical that we need to think about a new way to talk about this because that way is not working. We're seeing that. We're not seeing solutions. And we need something that's gonna be more comprehensive, that's gonna incorporate other elements of election security. This doesn't mean that the DHS needs to own the security and safety of the transit industry of communications, but it means it needs to at least be considered. And we need to find ways to work together to make it better. And I think that's across the public and private sector, by the way. As I said earlier, this isn't just a government problem. This is a problem 
for everyone who is a part of a democratic nation, for everyone who supports their country and their government, we need to really think about this as a problem for the community. Now, while we're diving into this, I hope you've been at least in some way thinking about what your election day looks like and how this compares. And so really think about the different ways that you could affect an election and think about like, do you vote before work? Do you mail in your ballot? How do modern events change how you're gonna approach this problem? Are you gonna wanna wait in line? Are you on Twitter? Do you look at disinformation? And do you fact check or do you just see something that maybe sparks some agreement in you and share it? And how would you attack your own election day? Think about if you do um, spend a lot of time on Twitter, how you would feel if you saw a tweet from the election commission saying that the race was over and that someone had won midway through your day? How would that affect whether or not you would decide to go vote? What if you lost power? How would that affect if you decide whether or not to go vote? And then use that to think about how you can actually defend our elections. What you can do both as a citizen and in the private or public sector to contribute to election security and try to make sure that we have elections that are based on a foundation of integrity. And moreover, if you're in one of these industries or an industry that in some way could impact election security, think about this. Think about what it means to have security in these areas and to make sure that these systems are secure so that our election day is as safe as it can be. And when it comes to what can we do to protect democracy, I think that what's most important is first off, security, we need to continue to push the message of security is key and continue to think about in our own industries what we can do to make sure that we are more secure, our company is more secure, and we're not accidentally spreading any disinformation or contributing to one of these elements. Like if you work for the electric grid, maybe bring up, hey, do we have a plan in place for if we are under a cyber attack during election day? Are we prepared for potentially needing extra capabilities for election day? Things like that need to be asked and answered. The second is to develop relationships with the government. There are great programs, especially in the United States, like InfraGuard, I'm a part of InfraGuard, that are really important to make sure that we can work with um, the government to protect our country and to make our country stronger. And the last thing is, of course, to fight misinformation and disinformation. Don't share disinformation. If you're not sure, double check. If you feel like it connects with your views too much, it's worth double checking. A lot of times, clickbaity titles really just further the problem. So really think about what you're sharing and when, and try not to engage with disinformation, just report it. Because the more you engage, the further it can spread. So thank you guys so much. Um, I'm so happy to be here with you, and I would love to take any questions you have. Uh, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter, too, um, or over email. And I'm sorry I was late again, but um, thank you guys so much. And yeah, please do let me know if you have any questions. You can send them in the chat or whatever. Sure thing. Ali, I have a question, <clears throat> and I'll say it. <laughs> um, so, you know, there's a lot of, and I love the presentation, by the way. So there's a lot of talk about information, integrity, um, protecting what we need, um, you yeah. know, as far as democracy is concerned. And as individuals, we do all of this work that you mentioned about, you know, ensure that we're voting, making sure that we're going to the polls and stopping the spread of disinformation. But it's really disheartening when the president himself spreads disinformation via tweet to his 86 million followers. So I was just wondering if you are aware of anything that's in place right now 
or maybe some laws or regulations that uh, may be coming down the pipe that will um, either address that, prevent that, or have some type of, uh, what do you call it? Uh, um, forget the word I'm looking for, but is there some type of uh, punishment for purposely spreading disinformation when it comes to the election? Yeah, that's a great, a great point. Um, it is disheartening for me as well. Uh, I'm deeply, deeply frustrated by things like that. Um, I, so a couple of, couple of answers. On the punishment side, doubtful, of course, because as we're seeing, there are a lot of things that are arguably worse than spreading disinformation online that the president is not punished for doing. Um, second, on the aspect of like any rule or law coming into place regarding this, again, I think it's very doubtful that that gets through in the current with the current political state. I think that it's that's one of the reasons that it's so critical for everyone to go vote. Um, and the only other thing that I can say about that is, luckily, there are people who follow him on Twitter that do not agree with his views. Um, I am one of them because I think that it's just really important to see what's happening, even if I am horrified by it. Um, and to just try to, to the best of your ability, share information that is true. And if you meet people who believe this or who are on the fence, try to have an open conversation where you hear their perspective, but don't give ground and agree to things that aren't true. And it's very, very difficult. It's very, very challenging. I struggle with this myself. My grandfather is a huge supporter of President Trump, and I've tried to have conversations with him where I say, well, you know, he's spreading a bunch of things that aren't true. Um, and the conversation consistently comes back to different values. And that's very hard to work through. But I think that if we can at least maintain an open dialogue and try to lead with logic instead of emotion, we'll eventually get to a better place. It's just, it's not going to be tomorrow. And it's probably not going to be by November 3rd. Hopefully, November 4th, we'll start to see um, change taking place. And I highly recommend not just going out to vote, but also contributing to groups that are trying to get out the vote um, so that we can we can really make a change. But I think that we need really to be diligent in not letting this happen again. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And looks like there's one more question that. from Darrow. Um, um, basically asking if it's a lost cause. Um, sometimes I think about that, especially in my line of work and having to create social engineering, emails and campaigns and things of that nature. Um, do you see an end to this? I feel like with the last couple of elections, the um, interest in creating social media campaigns has just gone you know, to astronomical amounts and to include you know, small pockets of Facebook groups and you know, these individuals are are being influenced and they may not have access to what may be the truth, or maybe they feel like what they do have access to is already the truth. So, like, are we fighting a losing battle right now, in your opinion? I think that, as we all know, it can feel that way in security a lot of the time, not just with social media or with elections, but generally it can feel like a losing battle just because sometimes that's on the side that we're on, um, especially when we struggle to get things like the resources that we feel we need to defend better. I don't think it's hopeless. I think that it's always going to be a problem, but uh, that's the same with security. We There's no silver bullet here. And we need to be aware of that. 
And this is one of the reasons why I think it's so important to bring up social media companies needing to take responsibility at some point, because <laughs> right now their responsibility has been, their taking responsibility has been so limited and they're really the only ones who have the infrastructure and access to be able to effectively drive change on these platforms. And while I do think that it's very easy to say, oh, it's a, it's a free speech thing and we have to let it go, the reality, we just cannot accept that from people like this. It's completely unacceptable. And um, I think that there is possibility for change but it really needs to come with the support of social media companies and creative ideas to solve the problem on their end as well. We can, as you said, do what we're able to do as citizens, but without that support, I think it's like incredibly difficult. It's an incredibly difficult problem to solve. So that's why I think it's so important to bring up the social media company aspect of this. Okay, true, true, thanks. And that kind of addresses the last uh, two questions that we saw about it coming in, coming into law and um, seeing if owners of these social media companies will actually step up to the plate and you know not take the money and do what's right when it comes to um, integrity in elections. <laughs> and that's the thing, like it's not even that much money. I think that they're just afraid, like the political ads, not even that much money for Facebook. But I think they're just afraid of losing their, like with Facebook, it's got to be approaching their core base now is very much so aligned to, I imagine, supporters of President Trump because it's more of the older generation. A lot of younger people are not on Facebook as much anymore. And so they probably just don't know what to do. And they're floundering because they're worried that they'll lose the major support that they have. But it, they're going to do that either way. And so I think that, yeah, we need to see some change there. Okay. Um, Ali, I want to thank you for the presentation. It was amazing. Um, oh, everyone, you can, th you can see Ali's information. Definitely contact her for any further questions and comments you may have. Um, Ali, anytime you would like to present, uh, just let me know. We can work out something because this was great. Thank um, you. Everyone else, I sent a link to our next um, virtual meetup, we'll, which will be on um, launching your career in AI, ML, and drone technology. So, um, with that being said, you know, look forward to hearing from everyone, really. So, follow Ali on. Twitter, and um, you know, we'll see how it we'll see how it all goes. You know, in a couple months. Go vote. <laughs> yes. Go vote. Go vote. All right. Thank you, Ali, and have a great Thank day, you. everyone. Have a great day. Bye, guys.